Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is best-selling author James Reston Jr., who also happens to be a Wilson Center Global Fellow. And Jim joins us to discuss his newest book, the 19th of his prolific career, and it's titled The 19th Hijacker, a novel of 9-11. Jim, welcome. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. And Bye. congratulations on your latest work of historic fiction, a really terrific piece of, of writing. Thank you so much. So before uh, we hear from you, let's talk about what some others have said about the book who've had a chance to get an advanced copy. Uh, here, here's a, a statement from an attorney for defendants in Guantanamo Bay. And he says, the 19th hijacker captures perfectly the minds of these men. The book does so in a way that does not evoke any sympathy for its main character or his girlfriend. At a time when young men and women from around the world are still drawn to radical Islam, it is important for all of us to understand the draw that recruits, that recruiters sell to these young people. That's from him and then from no less a source than the co-chair of the 9-11 Commission, Governor Tom Kane, former governor of New Jersey, he wrote, through fiction, we may gain insight into the conspirators and their, method, conspirators and their methods, which we cannot gain in any other way. High praise, indeed. And speaking of 9-11 co-chairs, could we begin by having you tell the story of, of what Lee Hamilton's role was in the writing of this book and why you decided to dedicate the book to Lee? Yeah, Lee's, Lee's involvement is absolutely critical. He was the catalyst for the whole thing. He was 10 years ago. This is a book that's been underway on and off for 10 years at lunch at uh, the Wilson Center talking about his role as the co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission. And he was, he's a great storyteller. We somehow got um, moved to the question of the 19 perpetrators. And he said that the 9-11 Commission was uh, you know, very busy and didn't have really the time to look into the lives of the 19 perpetrators. But there was one in particular that interested him and Governor Kane and the others especially. And that was the pilot that took the plane down in Shanksville. The reason that uh, they were all, and Lee in particular, interested was that the uh, Shanksville hijacker pilot was different in two really important ways. One was that he was not Saudi Arabian, but uh, Lebanese. But much more importantly, he almost pulled out of the 9-11 operation about a month before 9-11 itself. And he almost did so because of a romantic relationship with a woman in Germany. Well, I was instantly interested in that. And so that's the story you tell. You, uh, uh, through research and through imagination, you tell his story, his girlfriend's story, and a police inspector's story. Right. So uh, I always wonder when an author spends as much time on a book and does as meticulous amount of research as you've done of when you first began researching and writing, did you end up with the book that you thought you would at the onset? Well, it's been a, it's been quite a journey, this, uh, this book. Um, I was inclined at the beginning to try to write this, this story as a nonfiction work. And Lee Hamilton said he would try to help me in any way that, uh, that uh, he could, it quickly turned out that all of the information in the files of the 9-11 Commission relating to the perpetrators was classified. It remains classified because uh, there are ongoing legal uh, proceedings. And so that material, if it ever comes out, um, you know, uh, it, it's going to be a very long time. So I came to a juncture of whether to give up the whole idea or to uh, launch into a work of imagination about it, to try to, from on the basis of all the information that one could possibly glean everywhere, uh, whether you could launch from that body of fact into imagining what the, the life and the choice of this uh, hijacker was. So, um, so that was the, the in, uh, initial juncture of the thing. 
any good historical novelist does every poss uh, possible bit of research that uh, he or she possibly can, uh, and then launches from there into the imagination with the hope that uh, the final work as a combination of a launch from historical fact into imagination has the sense of authenticity or reality that the reader would read uh, the book with fascination, hopefully, and say, you know, well, it really could have happened this way. Well, you sir, mission accomplished, Jim. I, I have to say, I had to remind myself throughout reading the book that it was a work of fiction uh, because it comes across as so authentic and as if actual audio tapes existed. The Along with that, so describe the research, the level of research. I know there was travel involved. How did you go about getting inside the heads of your protagonists? Well, um, I should have mentioned a minute ago that another thing that was in the actual uh, documents of the 9-11 Commission was a letter that the Shanksville pilot had written to his girlfriend the night before the operation from a a, uh, a motel in Newark, New Jersey. It was a love letter and a goodbye letter. And along the way and launching into this as a novel, uh, it occurred to me, well, maybe he did a lot more than just write a final love letter to this woman, but because he was so much in conflict about whether to go forward with the operation or to bail out and flee with her, that he would have made tape recordings of the final uh, months of his life uh, in which he used those tape recordings to try to sort out whether he would go forward or he would uh, flee. So all of the tape recordings is totally uh, imagined the set, uh, set of uh, recollections by this fictional character. However, uh, I had um, gone to Beirut to look into the actual life of the hijacker. I had talked to uh, his uncle, who was a very distinguished gentleman uh, who was actually in the legislature of Le Lebanon, totally in denial that his nephew was the hijacker. And I also went to Hamburg and spent a good bit of time with, with a lawyer there who, who had been involved in one of the few cases of the remaining survivors of the, of the so-called Hamburg cell. So um, it was important to me if I wanted to try to understand the motivation of this character to understand where he came from, what kind of family he came from, and then how he got caught up in this uh, this web of conspiracy in Hamburg. You know, I, I'm determined to do a spoiler-free interview because I wouldn't want to spoil this terrific narrative for anyone who reads it, uh, because there is a mystery involved and there are resolutions that are surprising. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I will avoid specifics about the characters and the plot, Unless, you, of course, John. you want to introduce any of those. That's up to the <laughs> author's right. call, author's call, not the interviewer okay. who's going to do the spoilers. Yeah. I'll, I'll but, try to uh, restrain myself. <laughs> one, of, one of your advanced readers used the phrase that you've managed to move from abstractions to human beings. And, and I think, again, you know, that there's so many things that are impressive about the novel, but that alone really stands out is that I have a sense of people that I could relate to. And empathy doesn't necessarily mean sympathy, right, when it comes to terrorists. But I had a sense that I could relate to the real life struggles, or at least the imaginary real life struggles that you depicted on the page. Well, those 19 perpetrators, for very good reason, have been so dehumanized. They are, to the American people, monsters. And ultimately, Maybe they are monsters. They they are monsters for what they uh, what they actually did. But if you start out any any work, it doesn't have to be a novel. It it uh, could also be a work of nonfiction. With the starting point being that your character is totally evil, then there is nowhere to go with that story. I actually faced that this same. 
uh, 30 years ago when I wrote a book about Jonestown, where in that case, the mass suicide in, in Guyana, everybody knows what the end of that was. Well, everybody knows what the end of 9-11 of is. But for me, an initial press in this whole thing was how could somebody from a very fine middle-class family in Beirut, very good looking guy with the whole world in his hands basically, um, could have ended from that beginning in the mud of Shanksville. That's a big, big arc of a story to understand. Now, if he was so-called radicalized, this is another dehumanizing uh, word in my view, if you just assume, well, he got radicalized in Hamburg and that was the end of it. That's not a story, that, uh, that is the end of the story there. Uh, I wanted to know how he get, got sucked into this, uh, this whole conspiracy when he really was in conflict. If he had been a character like Muhammad Atta, the, the um, you know, mastermind of the 9-11 thing, who was just a kind of straight line of radical rhetoric from um, the Middle East, it would not have interested me to write about it. But someone who had lots of other possibilities in, in life, who gets sucked into it, maybe because he's weak um, and, um, and really is just kind of dragged along, uh, that interested me a great deal. Well, and, and you know, there's so much there that uh, I was making connections as I was reading the book in the aftermath of the attack on the Capitol by rioters a week or so ago. And, and one of the things that you depict the character Sami Haddad as, as uh, someone who had vulnerabilities, who had uh, uncertainties about his life and, and didn't have the same sense of purpose that the Muhammad Atta character does. Exactly. And it showed the how the appeal for someone who is adrift the appeal of someone, even though he doesn't like Ada in your telling of the tale, he is attracted to his certainty and his sense of purpose because that's something that that he desires. Do you see parallels between some of the interviews we've seen with those who stormed the Capitol where they're susceptible, vulnerable to falling for QAnon uh, conspiracy theories because they're looking for a sense of mission and purpose? There could be, John, um, and I'm gonna leave that for you to sort out. Yeah, on well, I'm side practicing psychology time, without but a there, license here, Jim. Yeah, but there is a um, uh, there is a great gulf there, I think, between the story I told and and the Capitol event. But the vulnerabilities are um, are crucial in this whole thing. To be able to say that this group of nineteen was not a happy band of brothers; they were not just all alike. And while I, I try as best I can uh, talking about the book to, to not to, to uh, slide over into what actually happened as opposed to what's told mm -hmm. in, in the book, it's very clear that the actual Shanksville pilot detested Muhammad Atta. They were really at loggerheads straight, straight from the beginning. And there is good evidence to that effect. That too interested me as a, as a plot uh, a plot point for all of this because it uh, it made the conflict even starker for for him uh, in terms of the final choice. You've written uh, this is your nineteenth book and you've written both fiction and nonfiction. Could you describe a bit about the process of how much you hold yourself accountable to actual historic facts and how much you grant yourself artistic license? Is there a, a formula you adhere to or guidepost you adhere to, or is it more organic than that? Well, I'm very driven by a, an essay that Virginia Woolf uh, wrote um, in the last uh, century uh, about the art of biography. And in that essay, she talks about great biography being not all the facts, but the creative facts or what she calls the, the fertile facts. 
Uh, that principle can be applied, I think, to all good writing, nonfiction and, and fiction, because then if you, if you focus on fertile facts that go to the, um, the character or the, yeah, of the, the go, go that elucidate the character, um, then you can stitch together scenes that are, um, you know, very, um, uh, you know, that vo move with a, with a strong narrative, narrative flow. So that's the one principle that, um, that I would use. The uh, background of this also, or motivation of this has to do with the fact that I had done three, um, I had done three books of uh, history before about the clash of uh, Islam and, um, and Christianity and history. And, um, and I really wanted to bring this knowledge into the, uh, into the current day. Uh, and the other thing that was uh, very much a part of the texture of this book is that uh, when I was a young guy in the um, United States Army in, in uh, the Vietnam era, I was trained in the recruitment of foreign agents. And I wanted to transfer that knowledge to the notion of the recruitment of an Islamic terrorist. So um, it's a very subtle process. Uh, it's always effective and successful when the target of recruitment has vulnerabilities. And that's why, uh, why you had spoken earlier about the characters I've drawn here is, is very vulnerable in many ways to, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this effort. Do you see this, uh, Jim, uh, when, often, you know, the question when you're endeavoring to create anything is what you want the viewer, the listener, the reader to take away. Uh, do you think of it in those terms or, or do you just tell a good story and let people decide what they take away? The latter. <laughs> I, I um, you know, I regard myself as a storyteller first and, and foremost. Um, Lee Hamilton put me onto a tremendously important story that had never been told. Uh, I, th I venture to say in all humility that this book is absolutely original and unique in the literature of 9-11 uh, because 9-11 uh, has been so raw in the American sensibility for so many years. It was certainly raw at the 10th anniversary. Uh, and um, as a result, what's been written about it in book form almost exclusively is on the side of the victims. Uh, and almost nothing until now on the side of the perpetrators in any, as you stretch, stress, John, in a human way to, to understand how one human being could go on this amazing uh, trajectory. I can't imagine this won't be useful to people who are in the business of understanding motivation and recruitment, even though it is a work of fiction. It certainly is. It, it, of all the works of fiction I've read, uh, this one is as close to actual reality. Again, it's like watching a movie where you have to remind yourself that it's not a documentary, that it's actually a film. Jim, congratulations again. This is a, a terrific book. I hope it gets all the attention it deserves and the timing. We are, are talking about the 20th anniversary. You mentioned 10 years out. Hard to believe it's 20 years later, isn't it? Yes. Yes. But again, I think this is a, is a point. Does it mean that uh, after 20 years, 9-11 as an event has gotten uh, digested into the American consciousness uh, in a in a much fuller way that that uh, readers of good books would be open to a work like this and not repelled by it because of uh, the fact that it was an attack on America. Well, I think you've you've added the third dimension to our understanding of of what did happen back then and uh, you know uh, ominously what could still happen right We're not out of the woods in that regard yet. Right. Jim Reston, thank you. Congratulations. The book is The 19th Hijacker. Uh, depending on when you see this, it's either available now or available for pre-order. And we hope you'll enjoy the book as much as I've enjoyed it and as much as I enjoyed talking to Jim today. Thanks again. Thank you, John. 
We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.